Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I apologize to those of you that have heard all this before. Um, but for those of you that haven't, I think you're going to hear some of the same themes coming up. Um, and as somebody that's worked on fish for a long time, I have to say that I was actually surprised that we were able to detect as many effects of both watershed, land use, and shoreline type on near shore fish assemblages uh, as, as we did. And you're going to see some of the same kinds of things being repeated that we saw for water birds and for SAV. Um, the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, was uh, done, uh, a, a lot of it was, work was done by a former postdoc, Matt Cornis, who's working for Fish and Wildlife now. Um, and I've got just one slide I'm going to show of Rochelle Seitz, who did work on benthic invertebrates. Um, she would be great to have up here to give her, uh, also to have a little fuller uh, explanation of the work that she did. Um, so this is kind of what you've seen before. Um, what we did is we looked at land cover, that are including agriculture, um, native marsh vegetation, I'm sorry, um, sorry, agriculture, forest, uh, developed land, um, uh, and um, uh, marshes, especially near shore. And then we looked at uh, right along the shore, what, what kind of uh, structures were there, whether it was riprap, bulkhead, native marshes, or beach. Um, we uh, sampled in two ways, uh, kind of traditional beach sains modified a little bit so that they were uh, much more quantitative than beach saining normally would be. Um, and then with the help of Steve Giordano from NCBO, uh, we also sampled with 200 foot long beach sains uh, so that we could do a really good job of getting really highly mobile uh, uh, fish. Um, these were deployed using a boat um, and we got everything from, you know, big full-size striped bass to canos rays and everything as well as, as well as smaller things. It was a really effective way of, of sampling. Um, what we did is uh, our group did three years of sampling uh, in a essentially randomized block design. So at uh, about 25 sub-estuaries, we sampled uh, two sites of each uh, shoreline type, um, uh, one with uh, the big nets, and then in both cases we used small nets. Um, but then we also got together with a number of collaborators who were really generous in sharing their data, who had looked at similar issues uh, in the Bay, Rochelle, Donna Bilkovic from VIMS, um, Rich Beliscus and Tim Target uh, from Delaware. Tim was a co-PI on this project as well. Uh, Ryan King from that former project that you've heard about. Jim Uphoff from DNR. Steve Giordano and David Bruce from NCBO. And John Jacobs from um, the Oxford Lab. Um, and so among all of us, we had data on 45 sub within Chesapeake Bay, uh, over 600 samples, um, lots and lots of individuals. And by looking at this larger data set, we were able to pull apart a lot of relationships that the individual studies weren't, were not able to. And so basically what we did is we looked at factors affecting the abundance of basically just the 16 most abundant species in our samples, um, ranging from uh, forage species like mummy chugs and anchovies and, um, and, and spot uh, to some important fishery species, I mean spotter fish, but also croakers and striped bass and, and blue crabs. So we had quite an array of species that we had enough data uh, to look at. Um, and um, um, we, there were also differences in the uh, food available for fish in the different shorelines. And so what Rochelle found is, in fact, uh, again, benthic prey were more abundant along the marsh and the beaches then along riprap or bulkhead, uh, higher biomass in the beaches, and higher diversity 
in marshes and beaches. So food is more abundant in some of these habitats than others. Um, but then the other thing is the reason that body size and how bottom-oriented uh, species are comes into play is probably because what happens, whether you're putting in bulkhead or riprap, uh, you're essentially eliminating this very shallow nearshore habitat that essentially becomes a refuge from larger bodied predators. Um, so the, the larger species get right up to shore um, if you've got uh, a bulkhead or riprap reinforcing that shoreline. And this is the, this sort of effect has been uh, seen before in some experimental work and sampling that Tuck Hines and Greg Ruiz did quite a few uh, years ago. But essentially the greater water depth allows access to predators. Um, so the uh, second take-home message besides the fact that different species like different kinds of shorelines is that the proportion of the watershed uh, land use comprised of agriculture uh, is negatively related to nearshore abundances of several important species of blue crab, spot, and croaker. Um, and, and here are uh, the data and uh, it's pretty clear that as, as the percent of cropland in the watershed goes up, the abundances of a number of species decline. Um, the abundances of these species though um, is more of the species actually though are positively related to the amount of, of wetland in the watershed. So while three of the 16 species were negatively related to um, to agriculture, um, nine out of the 16 were significantly uh, positively related to the amount of wetlands in the watershed. Um, and this is just an example showing the, th the same three species as before. Again, the more wetland, uh, and this is within 100 meters of the shoreline, then the more abundant the number of these species are. Um, what we think is going on is that the high cropland uh, essentially results in high nitrogen uh, concentrations, which do two things because the fish aren't going to directly care about the nitrogen, but it results in lower oxygen and lower SAB, which would normally provide refuges for small uh, and juvenile fish. And the high cropland also probably displaces uh, the nearshore wetlands. Um, and this just shows some of the, uh, these relationships, some of which you've already just seen, but the more cropland in the watershed, the more nitrogen in the water, um, and, but here also, this is daytime salt oxygen <coughs> concentration in fairly shallow water. So even during the day, you see a negative effect on oxygen concentrations, um, uh, it's, and it's enough of an effect that should be affecting fish. Um, um, so if we try to develop a, essentially a composite relationship, um, the more cropland uh, um, in the watershed, um, the less SAV and wetlands you have, um, and essentially the less fish. Um, however, that's not universal. Um, there are some planktivores that increase with increasing agriculture, so, so that's important to re realize, um, especially something like menhaden. Uh, they're up in the water column and essentially what happens probably is, is we're fertilizing the system, there's more food, more menhaden. Um, juvenile uh, centrarchids uh, are also planktivores and they seem to at least somewhat benefit from uh, the cropland. Um, we actually had a stronger effect of shoreline hardening, stronger negative effect of shoreline hardening than we did of uh, cropland. Uh, again, nine out of the 16 species um, were negatively related to the amount of hardened shoreline in the sub-estuary. So it was a much more universal response uh, than agriculture. Um, and again, just using these same three species, 
blue crab spot and croaker as an example. Uh, and again, I'm just showing the univariate relationships, but we developed some multivariate models uh, that really predicted a very high percentage of the among subestuary variation. Um, but the um, abundance of blue crab spot, croaker, and quite a few other species declined as the amount of shoreline hardening in a subestuary uh, increased. And that shoreline hardening was again associated with the amount of developed land in the watershed. Um, I wanted to just really quickly run through one very quick thing uh, because I think it's another important effect of uh, riprap uh, shoreline hardening to think about. We took a look at the use of hardened shoreline uh, by sea nettle polyps, the overwintering stage of sea nettles, to see whether shoreline hardening might potentially increase uh, sea nettle uh, populations on the local level. Um, and we did quite an uh, elaborate, numerous uh, different kinds of field experiments. Um, but the bottom line is that you know orientation matters. Um, but if we put out granite in a bunch of different orientations um, and we put out oyster shell you know, on the bottom nearby, the average density of sea nettle polyps we get on those two habitats is just about the same, uh, 2.7 per square centimeter and 2.4 per square centimeter. Um, and that is how many are remaining by the following May if we put them out the previous summer. Um, so uh, what winds up being important here is whether the riprap is extending deep enough into the water so that it is submerged even during extreme low tides in the winter. Uh, but if it is, it is used just as heavily uh, as a recruitment site for sea nettle polyps as their natural substrate in the bay, which would have been oyster shells. And just uh, very simple. Um, Bottom line is that what we've been seeing is that fish, shellfish, and jellyfish are all strongly affected by both land use and shoreline harming. Thanks. Thank you.